So just to reintroduce uh, myself, I'm Jason E. Bowman, and I'm the program leader in the MFA in Fine Art here at Valland Academy, and welcome back to this afternoon's um, proceedings on anatomizing the museum two, which is, as I explained, is a program of seminars interrogating the relations um, between contemporary art and museum frameworks overall, both including and displaying exhibitionary terms but also in terms of museum practices. Um, as we were putting the seminar together, as I explained, we had a set of questions that were beginning to arise in terms of the post-occupied condition, potentially, and what it might mean in terms of artist interventions within museum contexts. Um, including, for example, the recent sort of uh, work of Gulf Labour, and which has escalated uh, last week um, in the Gulf. But um, at the same time, we were just finalising aspects of the seminar. It was announced that uh, BP British Petroleum was no longer um, continuing its sponsorship of Tate amidst other organisations which it sponsors. And we have a consciousness, of course, of the work of Liberate Tate which has conducted 17 unsanctioned interventions um, within, within Tate itself, and it seemed prescient, um, though with quite short notice, to invite uh, representatives <coughs> of Liberate Tate, which is a collective of over 500 people, um, to address us today, and their request was that they would agree to address the seminar, but they would want to do it by Skype, um, which is acceptable to us. Obviously, we hope the technology all works out and we'll just sort of deal with it as we come along. But as most of you in the room who deal with me on a regular basis will know, I am a complete technophobe. Um, and therefore, I requested that my colleague, Shell Kamina, take over the moderation for this specific session in order to sort of recuperate my nervousness about um, moderating this Skype session. Um, Although my, my so phobia is kicking in now. So, <laughs> I, so I'm passing it to the, uh, the technological generation um, to be able to sort of moderate, moderate that. We have two representatives of um, Liberate Tape here with us, um, Haley and Mel, who are going to uh, talk about the interventionist um, tactics that they have used as a mode of our disobedience um, within the, the sort of work of Liberate Tate and 17 uh, manifestations um, within the Museological context apparatuses of uh, Tate. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Thanks very much for inviting us and for having us um, virtually part of the conversation today. We're really glad to be yeah discussing these questions with you, and um, really looking forward to um, yeah hearing hearing questions from you after our presentation. Um, and digging into the issues a little deeper at that point. So yeah, I'm Mel and this is Hayley. Uh, we've both been part of the Great Tate for over six years now and um, been on a long journey <laughs> to where we find ourselves today that we're going to share a little bit of you and, and relate it to the questions that you're looking at as part of, as part of your sessions. Um, today as well. So hopefully we can relate the two things to each other quite well. So just to kind of give you a, a clear overview, um, Liberate Tate has existed from the outset to free art from oil. So it's had the specific kind of niche aim of getting BP sponsorship out of Tate. But in doing so, that's been about opening up a larger conversation around a cultural relationship with the oil industry, the power that the oil industry holds over societies and questioning that, prodding that and removing that power because the access to the arts that the oil companies have is so fundamental to their profitability and survival and that's why they're desperate to keep it. And, you know, BP really didn't want to let go of this sponsorship and it's on account of the activities of artists and activists that has led to this change. So what, we, what we've been doing is, is making art that, that seeks to make real political change. And our interaction with the gallery 
is not, you know, as a kind of commissioned debate or conversation. It's unsanctioned, it's uninvited, it's un unwanted by the gallery. But we've been nurturing a kind of space of dissent within the institution, and that's how we've created change on this level. Yeah, so um, it's the museum that often chooses the artists and sets and conditions of the relationship with the artist. So they're already controlling what is going on within it, um, no matter how much they try to um, uh, kind of set up agendas that might kind of um, in some ways confront the museum. Um, and I think that the experience that um, I've had, and sorry, I'm Hayley, by the way, and just to introduce myself, is that the, um, in confronting the museum, that the museum is powerful. And in the act of confronting, we feel the power of the museum. And often we feel that power with our bodies because we're going in um, ourselves um, to do performances. And um, I just kind of wanted to say something really about the kind of the kind of process of Liberate Take, um, in that we have used all of our experiences as artists and activists kind of within this context, but there was also a sense at the beginning of this process of having to abandon lots of that, um, sort of both knowing and kind of uh, not knowing our skills, so we had to suspend a lot of that and we had to try and think of what was impossible. Um, imagine six years ago, the kind of the possibility of this happening at that time, it felt pretty impossible. And I think within that process, we really, um, and I know I did, and I think Melhat did as well, we, we constantly challenged ourselves, and we constantly challenged ourselves around, around what we could do. Um, so in challenging, we're also challenging the museum, within that we had to challenge ourselves um, and really kind of suspend what was um, what we knew as art and activism and move into a space that was totally unknown. So um, very briefly today we're going to um, do an introduction Um, a glossary of the objects that we've used in our Liberate Tape performances. Um, and we are going to go through that glossary alphabetically and not chronologically. Um, but we're going to tease out some of our tactics uh, in the examples that we're giving um, and hopefully give you a kind of wider idea of, of the different kind of things that we are doing. And this is obviously not all of the work that we've done, but just the kind of example that we can, uh, things that we can begin a conversation with. Great. So, Kiel, is the are the slides up? Can people yes. can we go to the slide with um, C is for cloth? Yeah, yeah. It's, up. it's up. Yeah, it's up. Wonderful. So this is a performance from a performance called Hidden Figures. We made this performance a few weeks before we were due to appear in court alongside Tate's lawyers. Um, and some other organisations who together we were challenging Tate on hiding the contractual details of the sponsorship deal with BP. Um, Tate had hidden it for years, we'd done freedom of information requests and tried to get how much money it was and what the terms of the contract were. And every document we got back was covered in these thick black lines saying, oh, BP, thick black line. And then we agreed, thick black line. You know, we couldn't get the details that we needed. We later went on to reveal how little money it was that they got from BP, but at this point it was unknown. And so we noticed that Tate were holding a Malevich, Kazimir Malevich exhibition, and I'm sure people are familiar with Malevich's Black Square. It's a famous painting that's been reinterpreted by different art activist groups at different times. And we did our own interpretation of it. And in a sense, our tactic here is using the aesthetics of the gallery against them and to challenge them. And we did this in two ways. Firstly, by responding to the live exhibition um, and actually making a performance intervention which related directly to an artwork that was on display in the gallery at the time. And secondly, because this was a very porous participatory performance, which is something that we then went on to really expand on in our work and, and make a whole range of participatory performances. But this was one of the first ones where we did that. And we actually had over 300 visitors interact with our performance in different ways, partly because it was so suitable for children. <laughs> so I don't know if you can tell from this image, but we're actually playing what in the UK is called the parachute game 
where you raise the cloth up and you run underneath and then it comes down. Um, and this was our way of, of playing with this idea that we were examining of Tate and BP hiding their relationship from us and us seeking to reveal it. And we can go on to the next slide now. So, uh, over to me. Um, this is, C is for charcoal. And charcoal is made by heating wood very slowly and it's often used by artists to draw with. In 2004, 100 members liberate Tate smuggled backpacks full of books on climate change, activism and art in the Anthropocene, um, and art, the Anthropocene, and the Anthropocene, um, charcoal and sustenance, but there's food, water and sleeping bags into the Tate modern turbine board. And uh, we performed Timepiece, and Timepiece was a durational performance that used words, bodies, charcoal, and sustenance. The performance took place from high tide on the 13th of June 2015, that's 11.53 a.m., if you don't actually remember the high tides from that date, until high tide on the 14th of June 2015, which was 12.55 p.m. So it was just, uh, just under 25 hours uh, in the Tate. Um, and uh, we entered the building just before midday. And at the point that we entered the building, um, the group split. And half the group uh, proceeded to set up a camp. Um, if you know the Tate Modern Turbine Hall, it's at the kind of base of the Tate Modern Turbine Hall just under the bridge. Um, and uh, the other half of Liberate Tate uh, put veils on. Uh, picked, chose a book, and began to, uh, after formally lining up uh, to signify the start of the performance, uh, began to um, write um, quotations from the books that we were reading on the turbine hall floor. And uh, we proceeded to do this uh, continuously over the next 25 hours, so throughout the, throughout the night. Um, one of the tactics that uh, were very is uh, has been very important to us um, has been using the media and press to really um, um, kind of augment what we're doing and distribute it because uh, otherwise it would be very easily suppressed and kind of pushed under the carpet um, and uh, what uh, timepiece did for us that uh, the performance lasting for 25 hours, uh, the occupation of the tape lasting for 25 hours, um, allowed us, uh, uh, gave us enough time for uh, the, the work to be picked up by uh, press and people globally. Um, and this piece of work got over 2.5 million impressions on Twitter uh, in the first, I don't know, was it in the first 12 hours? Um, and um, it created a twi Twitter storm um, in London. Uh, there are also videos of the performances, and in, in other works that we've done, we've kind of um, made sure that the video is um, accessible um, straight away just after the performance. Um, and with this one, images went out um, straight away. And another tactic uh, in relation to timepiece was um, uh, the occupation of the Tate. And that was a deliberate escalation of what we had done before. Um, we were also, we've always called our work performance, we've always located it within the context of fine art. Um, but, um, but we wanted to do something that would really put uh, pressure on the tape in relation to our presence and that where we couldn't, they couldn't just let it happen and let us go. Um, and the tape told us that if we went out by 10.30 p.m. that they would bring in the police. Um, and 10.30 p.m. that evening came um, and the police came um, and we were even, you know, we were ready for whatever might happen. Um, um, and we were still there, we hadn't gone. Um, maybe the tape presumed that we might have gone. Um, uh, but the police said that they would do what the tape wanted and the Tate wasn't going to evict us, so then we knew that we could stay overnight. Um, just to kind of add that um, in relation to that performance, um, another uh, a way into the institution was that, um, sorry, I meant to say before that when we arrived in the Tate Modern Turbine Hall, uh, we handed out letters 
from the PCS union to staff um, saying that their union was supportive of Liberate Tate. Um, and the PCS union, which represents a lot of the staff uh, in the Tate galleries and in actually a lot of Bath museums here, um, is part of the Art Not Oil Coalition. Um, um, and we're part of the Art Not Oil Coalition. So uh, a kind of another tactic was to um, offer kind of is, is to kind of offer friendship and solidarity with other workers um, inside the Tate. So uh, next slide, Pete, please. C is for compost loo. So um, what was all, is always really important with Liberate Tate is we think everything through. Um, and once the Tate decided that they would allow us to stay, um, they then shut, uh, or shut off any access to toilets. Um, and we hadn't revealed that we had a, um, anything um, that we wanted to use, that we could use until that point. Um, of course, we didn't want to um, reveal our hands, but as soon as they shut us, shut us off and out of any toilet facilities, we then put our own wonderful compost loo up. Uh, the compost loo had its own beautiful black tent. It had a little mirror inside, so one could check one's face um, and, um, and one could pee. We, we all peed very discreetly uh, inside the Tate Modern Turbine Hall. Um, and then when we left the next day, we very decorously carried it out um, and, um, and got rid of it. But um, the one thing, just to say, kind of augmenting and expanding on that evening spent in the Tate was that, um, that was a, a kind of very warm feeling of relationship with the Tate staff um, and um, uh, members that were very supportive of us, um, including members waving at us through windows once we had been cordoned off completely, um, and just the different acts of kindness um, on behalf of the staff. Over to you, ma'am. So next slide. I is for ink. So this is a performance called Birthmark, which we made at the very end of last year. So this is the, the final performance before um, the sponsorship was ended. Uh, and in this performance, we, uh, following on from what Hayley mentions there about our questions around escalating the confrontation and um, really making clear to the directors of Tate, who, you know, that's who the kind of antagonism is with, with the decision makers. And let's remember who the decision makers at Tate are. So obviously, you know, Nicholas Sirota, the director, has a lot of influence. But the chair of trustees at Tate is a guy called John Brown, Lord John Brown, who you may not be familiar with over there, but over here he's quite notorious. He worked for BP for the majority of his working life since he was 18 years old. His dad worked for BP. He was CEO of BP for 12 years and it was a couple of months after he stepped off BP's um, leadership that he, that he stepped onto Tate's board. So his allegiances are pretty clear. Um, we knew what he would want in this, in this process. Um, and so that's, that's who the the antagonism is with and the, the solidarity with the staff is, is around, yeah, wanting to, knowing how many of the staff at Tate really didn't want BP to be present there as much as we didn't. So this performance birthmark was again taking it to a, a new and unexpected level where we did set up a real live tattoo parlour inside the gallery. And we did this um, really as, a, as part performance, part intervention, and also part ritual. Um, so we learn, four of us within the collective learn to give tattoos safely and well um, as part of the creative process for this project. And we did that partly because we wanted it to be a very ritualistic process of exchange between the person receiving the tattoo and the person giving the tattoo. And the performance was held on the eve of the Paris Climate Talks. So it was very much about this global moment of reckoning with climate change and taking action and the call for the museum to drop its oil sponsor because of that need globally to take action on climate change. 
and that in that time there was no place for BP in the gallery. And so the tattoos that people received was a number, um, the parts for me, and you might be able to just see mine on my shoulder here. So I have the number 343. Um, and that's the number of parts per million of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere in the year of my birth. So that's why the project's called Birthmark. And people have received tattoos who are, you know, people who are born in the 1950s to people who were born in the 1990s. And with that, you get this sense of change happening over our lifetimes. So what is the climate change that's happened that we've seen? And the, the difference for people who were born when the carbon dioxide levels were at safe levels, lower than 350, to those who were born when the, the levels of, of carbon dioxide are, are much more dangerous. Um, so this was, it was a very emotional performance. It was, it, was, uh, it was very intense in the gallery. And it was also something that absolutely um, nobody expected. Nobody saw that one coming. And I think that follows on again from timepiece, as Hayley's mentioned, because we were coming up, we knew at this point when we made this performance that we were coming up to the time when Tate would be in negotiations with BP about whether or not to sign another five-year contract. And what we imagined was that, you know, five years ago, when we'd initially started criticising Tate and artists had started criticising Tate for having the contract with BP, that Tate directors and BP staff thought, oh, well, you know, we can, we can weather that out. This, this fuss will die down after a few years. And our performances last year were about really showing Tate and BP that we had more stamina than they did and that we weren't giving up, we weren't going away and that the longer they maintained that deal, the more intense <laughs> our interventions and our challenges would become. Um, and it certainly felt like when we uh, when we set up this tattoo parlor that that, um, that sense of that was clear. And again, we you know our relationship with the staff by this point had developed to such an extent that we spent the day chatting with them. There were staff who were planning on going to the climate march the next day as part of their own you know participation in the mobilisation around the climate talks. It was a very um, yeah, it was very much a sense of, of togetherness with the actual workings of the museum in challenging the directorship on what was happening. Um, so I'll leave that one there, but we can always come back to it in conversation later. I'm aware of time, so we should probably whip through <laughs> our yeah. final few slides, really. Okay, so M is for molasses. Um, again, talking uh, Mel talking about timing. Uh, one of the things that we um, always um, we were always looking at global events um, and bringing them into the arguments that we're making in our work. In 2010, Tate was celebrating the 20th anniversary of its relationship with BP in the middle of of a deep water horizon spill. Um, and Liberate Tate had already done a couple of performances uh, at Tate by then, but it just seemed absolutely incredulous that um, the gallery would, would have the audacity to do that at that moment in time. Um, and we wanted to do something to highlight it in retention. Um, and Liberate Tate performed Licence to Spill on a wonderful summer evening uh, in June, um, and uh, it was a splash of performance. At 7 p.m., everyone gathered around the uh, Manton entrance, the side entrance of Tate Britain, where all the um, all the people, all the uh, were coming in to to the celebration. And suddenly, 12 figures appeared from one side, and they're all wearing black and walking very rapidly, carrying heavy canisters full of molasses, uh, 20 liters of molasses, to be precise. Um, and um, and they throw the molasses at the entrance, at the side entrance uh, to the Manton galleries, uh, making the whole area inaccessible. And then they add feathers to that mix um, to make it even more sticky and more difficult um, to move. Um, and I think that uh, this performance was incredibly shocking uh, at the time that it happened. Um, there was a great split in the 
uh, in, in the art world at that time um, around this shock. Um, but I think that the important thing was not letting, uh, not letting Tate get away with celebrating its relationship with BP during the Deepwater Horizon spill. Over to you, Mo. Great. So, Em is also from Molasses, and at this party, we also created a spill inside the gallery during the party, and that was part of why it was um, such a kind of important thing to intervene on, because we didn't want the kind of corporate party to go um, unquestioned and unchallenged, um, and so part of, the, part of the spill was inside the gallery itself, and that lasted about half an hour. That, that part of the performance. And please do, you know, go onto our website and you can see different images and videos of all of these performances. So do get a get a more of a feel for them there. I think for the sake of time so that we have enough time for questions, we've just got three minutes left to, to present these things. So Kiel, if it's okay, can we um can we go through the images quite quickly? Is that all right, Haley? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. we maybe won't go into all the detail and we'll go we'll we'll go to the final one. The gift. So M is for money, and that's when we revealed how little BP was sponsoring Tate. S is um, for Snorri Cam. That's when we um, marked the questioning in court of BP over the Deepwater Horizon disaster. S is for sunflower oil, and that's when we uh, remarked the Deepwater Horizon spill um, uh, a year on using sunflower oil with, pig with pigment. V is for veils, where we began this process of counting carbon in the, the BP-sponsored walk through British art that then led on to birthmark. And <laughs> W is for wind turbine blade. Oh yeah, wind turbine blade. This is when we gave a 1.5 uh, ton, 16 meter long wind turbine blade to the Tate and installed it for them in the Tate Modern Turbine Hall. Um, and the tactic there was to put internal pressure on the Tate because we were giving it to them as a gift to the nation. Uh, they had to then consider at board level. B is for bodies, um, where we found that uh, Tate staff might use the sort of tactics that might be traditionally associated with protest against us, but we did uh, manage to manoeuvre the wind turbine blade in, sneak it in somehow. And then finally, W is for winning. And that's where we are today after this, yeah, six year journey, never knowing if or when we would win, but keeping going and never giving up. And the image that you can see there is from the party um, that we held inside Tate Modern once we knew that the BP sponsorship was over. And that image was actually retweeted by the artist Abraham Cruviegas, whose work is also visible um, in that image. So it was quite, it was quite a nice uh, finishing touch, really, that the, the artist that we were kind of interacting with in the gallery was so supportive of what happened that, that he retweeted that, that image from the party. Um, oh, there is one more, isn't there, Hayley? Yeah, yeah. And there's a C is for publishing, which is about sharing information and bringing in voices from outside of Liberate Tate in, in ways that we can't speak, because we're speaking in a very, very particular way um, through, through the performances, but we, we may wish to um, other people to be able to speak, and, um, and I think that's been uh, very important. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, I think there was a Conrad Atkinson print there, yes. so sort of artists independently supporting us, making work that we could then, we sold to then help fund our activities. So yeah, if you are interested in the issue in more depth, then do check both of those things out. Um, but great, we'll, we'll leave it there so there's enough time for questions and we can dig into things more closely. Um, but yeah, thanks for... Okay, perhaps I start the conversation and then people ask later. I was I was wondering um, that last slide the the book does give a hint, but actually now th that's over. What is what is left? I mean, how the work you know is revived, or if we put what's happened with this collection or grouping of interventions in the take. 
uh, does it be uh, would it be located in a gallery if it's book what's the strategy from now on with the group even well in, i mean in terms of being over you know the whole the whole issue isn't over it's, it is at this point it is only taped of the the sort of major four bp sponsored institutions in london where the sponsorship has ended and there are other groups who've been challenging and targeting the other institutions such as the british museum and the national portrait gallery to end their sponsorship deals so we really are waiting with bated breath over the coming months to find out whether or not um the deals will be ended there as well of course we you know we really hope that they will be um but that's that's certainly you know somewhere we might want to lend our uh, <laughs> energies and focus to to be part of part of that and we're also you know really connected to different groups around the world in Norway in the US in um the Netherlands who are all um in their own kind of creative intervention dialogue with different institutions around other oil sponsorships and associations with oil companies so we're absolutely still part of these networks um creating change across the whole museum sector i think it's also important to remember that um that the the kind of the outcome was that bp um said that they would they were stopping to they were stop oh oh sorry miss you there we Lost her. I'm going to continue her point and see if she comes back. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, are you lost me? Oh, you're back. <laughs> I'm coming back. Hang on. Coming back. So BP said, um, "Oh, it's because we're, we're dropping this um, deal because it's a very it's a very challenging business environment." Now they said that at the same time as they increased the CEO's pay by twenty percent and received massive criticism for that from all their shareholders. So they're obviously not doing that badly, um, and this was clearly a decision that they weren't getting any benefit from being targeted so heavily within that context. Um, what we also know is that Tate would never turn around and say, "Oh yeah, we hated BP for ages. That's why we ended it." But I think we can um, we can also know that there were so many people inside the institution that were against the sponsorship that that's that's a big part of why it ended. Um, and that's why it would end in in other places as well. Haley, are you back? Yeah, am I back? Can you see me? We can't see you, but you can see me. Go okay. ahead, talk. Um, so I was just going to add about the you know so in a way also what our work at the Tate is to is to um, really um, to to get them to shift their ethical position because they haven't done that. So it's been kind of BP has made this decision not to continue sponsoring Tate, but the Tate hasn't been active internally in saying actually we don't want to accept. Oil they haven't publicly anymore. said that. They haven't yeah. publicly said that. Yeah. But we you know we know what's on the inside. Yeah. Oh, here I'm back. I'm back. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So there's a kind of fossil funds, fossil free fund, fossil fund free. What is yes. It fossil fossil funds free, funds free camp, uh, campaign where um, organisations and museums can sign up um, and say they will not accept um, fossil funds for their work. Uh, and it would be great if Tate signed up to that at that point. Yeah. We have another question, Mary. Hi. Great. I, I just have a very practical question. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Great. Yep. Um, can you talk about? Um, you, you mentioned something about uh, your actions were like extremely researched. You were prepared. Like, can you talk about that process of as a group deciding what kind of intervention you would do? How a performance would be structured? What were the limitations and boundaries of that? Yeah, so you know, we we operate very much as an artist collective. So there's um, it's very, very different. Some of us in the group who've had experiences of working in activist groups um, as well as art collectives, and I think that's been a big part is that we're drawing on two different traditions at once and sort of using both the similarities and the differences between those traditions. So we're an art collective in the sense that, you know, we collaborate, we make work together, and we have, I would, I would say, quite a slow process. You know, performance like Timepiece took 18 months to develop. Um, there's other performances which we spent two years on. So we'll, we'll be making, you know, 
making performance interventions at the same time as developing other other performances in parallel. We really we'd only make uh, performance once it was it was really ready, and that that process of seeing the work change and crystallise over the over the time that we spend developing it has been really um, fascinating to see it evolve and kind of our own understanding of the aesthetic develop as the years have gone by. And yet at the same time, working within with some of the tools of the traditions of direct action around having legal support for your activities, having practical sustenance to be able to continue with what you're doing and, and people taking risks around you know, potential legal consequences, arrest for activities. So being able to, to intertwine those two practices has been, has been fundamental to the process. Yeah, um, we've had we've got many different people from many different backgrounds in the group, um, and just on a kind of very kind of mundane, practical day to day level, we have an e list, um, and we share information on that list. So we've got kind of like what you might describe as a hive mind. Um, so we're all we're all educating ourselves around you know around our our subject BP and uh, Tate. So we kind of grow in as a group, knowing all of this information. Um, and, and, and in that way, the kind of the research is shared. Um, and uh, I think that, that I think Mel would agree with this, that the kind of creative process is like a sort of pulse or it's a kind of hive. It's not once we kind of got into a rhythm of working together, um, it was very, very difficult to really work out how things happened in a way, but they happened through through kind of these collective processes of making decisions and of what of achieving our aim and looking at the context um, and looking at the Tate and looking at the contemporary context and, and kind of and looking at art and aesthetics and activism, somehow bringing them all together into the argument to push what we want to do forward. Any Jason? I want to ask you something about um, discourse in a sense, um, which is around this um, term of unsanctioned. Um, and if you can maybe just explain to us what it is you actually mean by um, your operations being unsanctioned by the Tate. So, well, ma many things. So I'll kick off and then we'll see how they come in. So. Um, uninvited and uncommissioned, so no arrangement, no prior arrangement with the gallery that we'd be present. And then if we publicly announced performances, they would put um, bag searches on, the, on all the entrances to all their galleries. So on the occasions where we chose to do that because we wanted it to be open to the public to you know, know about in advance and come along to, we would have to sneak the objects in. So, for example, that um, black cloth, that 64 square metre black cloth, was snuck in in a baby buggy because nobody questions the woman with the baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, we've snuck, oh, we've snuck things in all kinds of ways. Obviously, a wind turbine blade, you can't sneak in so easily. And that's where you have a much more obvious, um, uh, unsanctioned moment whereby, you know, it was a, it was a physical struggle. To, to get it in. Um, I ended up face to face with the security guard who'd put his, his body on the line to prevent it coming in. Um, and we know, you know, from working with the Tate Union that they're not paid enough <laughs> to warrant that. Um, and we've, you know, we've worked alongside the union staff uh, to, to sort of further their concerns and issues. But so my, my argument to him is that actually for, for health and safety, it was better <laughs> to let us get on with it because we were we were going to take care of it safely. Um, you know, it's it's a tension, and I think part of what's interesting about your question is that when visitors would see the performances, some of them would think that it was a, a commissioned activity, and then they'd sort of question it. They're like, "Oh wait, but it's critical of the sponsors." You know, and they'd, they'd engage in this dialogue of working out what was going on and working out that tension so that it's not immediately obvious as some kind of protest, but that it's, it's you know, people are going to the gallery and they're engaging in this critical way with everything that they see there, and they do the same 
with our performance work. So it had to sort of it had to tread that sort of tightrope in a way that it wasn't it was using the um, aesthetics of the gallery against it, but at the same time it wasn't allowed and it was. It, it was impossible to co-opt because we kept making it more confrontational as we went on. Don't know what you'd yeah what you'd say to that, Haley. Yeah, I think that the um, the unsanctioned um, nature is is quite complex. Uh, so in relation to what Mel's saying is that you know where uh, an audience might actually think it is sanctioned and it something that's been commissioned by the Tate. So there's that there's that side of it. But there was also kind of like the trajectory of all of the performances from the beginning where there was kind of um, a real, like not knowing or testing of boundaries in, in relation to what the Tate would accept to kind of us being able to um, understand that actually if we did certain things that we weren't going to be arrested. And, and that then enabled us to make more ambitious things in that space. Um, and I think that we knew as well through um, internal board member meeting uh, minutes that um, one of the board members had expressed concern about any other forms of censorship around this. So there were, there was kind of like, there were bits of information that we kind of were piecing together through doing it, um, where we kind of found the boundaries of what could be acceptable, but then actually that's when we start escalating and start pushing the boundaries to get into that situation with time piece where uh, the Tate are put in a dilemma. What do they do um, in relation to the, the occupation of um, the Tate? So I think it's like a, it's it's very it's quite a, it's very complex in in that relationship. Thank you. Any other? Final comments or questions? I Denise? just have a, a question about your sustainability in a, I guess, a quite a risk averse funding situation now. How do you plan for you know your future sustainability? So we made quite a conscious choice about money and this work that we would. Um, we would free up our activity. When, you, when your activity is funded, it can be limited and it can be, you know, you have to sort of take different routes that are acceptable to different funders and what's, you know, what can you apply for funding for? What's going to be fundable? So we've never actually received funding for this work. Everybody who participates in the collective does that with their, you know, free time in a, in a, in a capitalist system. Um, and we've you know we've made money by doing talks and workshops and writing commissions and that's the money that we've spent on the materials that go into to making our performances we've you know we've, we've got a donate button on our website and sometimes people give to that and we've sold those prints that you saw from conrad atkinson so actually these performances just haven't cost <laughs> very much money um and what we've what we've given to it is um you know, because art is it's, it's complex, isn't it? Like when, as an artist, of course, you want to be, you need to, a roof over your head and you need food. And we absolutely support, or alongside all different kind of, especially in the UK at the moment, like preservation of funding for the arts. At the same time, there's a certain freedom in not being bound to certain funding um, limitations. So that's what we've chosen for this project, is to kind of have it exist outside of, you know, no one's been paid for anything that they've been involved in for this work, apart from video makers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't quite um, hear the question, but I'd just like to say to Mel, uh, say, uh, what Mel said, it's actually been very liberating as an artist to just be able to work um, in that unbounded way, actually. Um, and um, it's been tough um, because you know there's um, kind of no money for your labour, but um, it's been incredibly um, inspiring and very. Uh, um, um, I don't know what to say. It's just been quite amazing to be able to work with that and to be able to self fund and somehow self fund it um, in in a particular way. I think we're out of time.
But yeah. If you right. have anything like a final note to say. <laughs> I would just, you know, it'd be great to hear if um, at the end of the day there's any reflections from the, the rest of the discussions that you have as part of, yeah, as part of the different sessions that you want to feed back to us. We just, yeah, is it, you know, obviously what we're missing out on by not being physically present is the sort of ongoing discussion around how the different elements intersect. So please, please do feel free to email, email those over. We'd be really interested to hear them. And yeah, look us up on Twitter and Facebook. We're still going. There's more to come. So we're going to hear from people in the future. Okay. Yeah, and I'd just like to say thank you very much for inviting us. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here with you via Skype, and we're sorry that we couldn't come in person. Thank you for accepting.